All right, here we go. So yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us and our kind of workshop on social media, uh, specifically for artists. And most of this is done through the perspective as, uh, as an Asian American artist as well. You'll see in the background, there's all these pictures are from uh, my career in the slants. So you'll see a lot of pictures of like me or my bandmates. A couple of the board members are in these random things or just some of the events we've had. So uh, bear with me, it's just easier than just digging through tons of stock photos. Here's a little bit about me and kind of the experience that I had that kind of brought me to this particular point. Uh, so my name is Simon Tam. I'm the founder of an Asian American band called The Slants and also one of the founders behind The Slants Foundation. We're a 501c3, a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to pro uh, providing mentorship and resources for artists, activists of color, but primarily in the Asian American space. Um, over the years, we've had 13 TEDx talks, uh, which I'll dive into more later and how we kind of, how I got into that particular world. I was the creator of the first uh, digital and social media degree program in the US. Uh, that program eventually got co-opted and adapted for many other programs, including uh, across Canada and the US. So I think a lot of my materials on social and digital marketing um, are used in about 70 different universities now. Um, and I taught digital marketing and do consulting for companies like Walmart, Verizon. I actually helped build out part of Facebook system, um, worked with the co-founder of Google to create more culturally competent marketing. So this has been my space for a very long time. Um, I'm the host of the largest music business podcast in the world called Music Business Hacks. And uh, over the years, I've been honored to kind of get coverage in over 3000 media features in 125 countries uh, for my music career. And we, our band won a landmark case at the Supreme Court. So um, kind of a wide breadth of experience, but certainly social was one of those tools that I used to help get a lot of these different things. And uh, it was just one of the tools in the toolkit, but this is something that I wanna speak to you about tonight because a lot of my experience is grounded very much in achieving certain things in particular for an arts career. So I don't like to do things for like, social media just for doing it because everyone else is doing it. I like to do it very strategically and to make sure that it's actually working to support um, the craft. And this is something that I want to kind of talk about tonight as far as the approach. We'll kind of do a broad overview, but also step back a little bit uh, to, to make sure that we kind of get that larger picture, uh, but then kind of dive into very, very specific tactical things, things that you could walk away with and, and apply today. So if you're, if you're taking notes, I highly encourage you to do so. And if you have questions about any of the things that I, I refer to, um, please let me know. You can drop it in the chat box and we'll go ahead and, and uh, you know, let, make sure that you get all the URLs and all the tips. So first thing um, that I kind of mentioned here is that we need to think big picture. And those of you who've kind of um, listen to my talks at music business conferences or kind of anything um, that I've done to help mentor artists know that I oftentimes use this metaphor, this illustration that I believe that every artist should kind of have in mind. And that's if, if to, because I, I love using analogies to help understand kind of complex ideas. One of those most complex things has to do with an artist's career. Um, so I like to compare it to a house. Imagine you have a house that you're living in and that the whole point of this house is to get people to the backyard because you got a custom party there. This is like the, an analogy for your career. Now, everything that's outside of the house, in the front of the house, the street, the front yard, the porch, that's like your social media. That's like your website. It's not actually the house itself. It's what pe people first see before they get in. And then the the house itself is constructed of a couple of different areas. The living room is where you actually engage with people. Once you welcome them into your home, you kind of think of that as a, the entertainment space where you can actually get to know them better. The kitchen is where you're cooking up your next project. So it's kind of the mess that no one sees, but you wanna increase that engagement so people join the party out back. Then all your bedrooms upstairs, those are your different sources of revenue. So that could be licensing, it could be live performances, it could be side hustles like teaching, it could be um, streaming, it could be merchandise. So there's a lot of different pieces of this, but it's important to 
kind of think of this analogy throughout the process because um, a lot of times people will get hung up on the social piece thinking that's their end goal, but it's only a very small part of it. And as we kind of go into the details of this, I hope you'll understand why. Uh, one of those things that uh, help understand like what a house is or like a house of music or you know, house of art is thinking about this kind of concept. Like a lot of times people talk about branding and they're like, oh, you gotta brand this, you gotta brand that. Uh, but a brand really isn't the kind of stuff where we tend to think of it like a logo or specific colors. Those are elements of that, but the brand is really a relationship. It's what other people know you by. So while you can help influence this, you can't entirely control this. Uh, for example, for a number of years, particularly after a certain documentary was made about McDonald's uh, that was just slamming them for how horrible for your, for your health um, that it is, you know, the, the film Super Size Me, McDonald's tried to change their brand. They tried to claim that they were actually a healthy restaurant, a healthy fast food experience. But I think very quickly, people could see right through that. No one thinks of McDonald's as like a health food restaurant. Um, so while they tried to brand themselves as that, their brand or the relationship with their customers was actually very, very different. And so sometimes what we try and project ourselves as might not actually be what it is. But social is one of those tools that can help shape that and particularly through engagement. So, um, I'd like to kind of think big picture here. There's a lot of different social media channels out there. In fact, by uh, kind of the newest count, there's nearly uh, 2,500 major social media companies. So that's all over the place, right? And of course, people generally don't have the capacity to kind of uh, use all of them all at once. Otherwise, even if you had a you know, team of like 20 people, that's still not enough people to cover all those channels. I kind of want to begin with this poll here um, of, oh, I'm sorry here. My mouse disappears in screen share, so please bear with me. Okay, this is not. So I'm going to launch this poll here. Um, if you could just quickly answer, feel free to select as many as you want here. Um, which social media channels are you actively using? And by active, I mean, you post on there at least once per week. So if it's something that like you have, like an account that you have, but you don't actually use, don't, don't worry about it. And can, can you folks see the poll on your screens? Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to chime in about the branding thing because I worked for over a decade as a creative director in various ad agencies and specifically um, my expertise is corporate branding and brand identity and once we create the brand identity for the company or the product which is their logo you know colors and all that the client thinks that that's the brand <laughs> but then we have to explain to them that's just your brand identity, your brand is going to be what people think about you over time. And so you're gonna to have to be on your best behavior and communicate and do actually be an active participant in what your mission is and what your beliefs are. Indeed, thank you. So I'm not seeing folks actually answer the poll. Are is, that, is anyone having trouble with it? I just responded, no, no problem. Okay, so maybe it's just not showing this percentage of voting, but I'll, let's go ahead and we'll end this now. And um, we'll just kind of hold off on that for now and redo this here. Um, okay, so when we talk about social media, I oftentimes really encourage folks to be very strategic in their choices because we only have so much bandwidth. We only have so much time, capacity, money. And it's really important to kind of um, be selective about this. 
And when you we think about like what we what kind of decisions go into choosing the platforms that we appear on, I think um, oftentimes we're guided by what's popular, like what's popping right now, what's 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 everyone talking about. But I think that's a mistake because I think first of all you have to understand who your core audience is and think about is that a channel that they're actually going to be using it, or where they already are? Because you want to engage with the, the right people, not necessarily a mass amount of people, right? Uh, for example, if you were coordinating with, say, let's say you, one of the most popular websites in, in the world, and you're like, oh, that sounds great. I want to have my music video featured there. But what if you found out that you know, ultra popular site was like Pornhub or something like that? You're like, okay, maybe that's not the best fit for this. Well, who knows, maybe it is for you, but like, it's important to understand, like, is it the right audience? Not just, is it a big audience? And that's where it's really important to distinguish that. Uh, also, uh, I think about, is a site going to be sustainable? Because not all sites will last. They might be a flash in the pan. They might be popular for a moment, but then they could fizzle out. I mean, think about it. Certain companies like Pinterest, um, Snapchat, Zillow, Uber, they actually haven't made a single dollar in profit yet. They're all like on leveraged debt. So it's very possible that they'll either get bought out like Tumblr was or like so many other social media channels or they'll kind of fade away into obscurity like MySpace and, and for the most part Friendster. So it's really important to make sure that it's the right channels, but uh, even if you jump in, that it ultimately leads to these kind of bigger goals that, that you have as an artist. So uh, that's why I always say, like, begin with your goals. Like, what is your actual objective? What is it that you're trying to achieve? Uh, you know, instead of beginning with the actions that lead to the goals, like your tactics, which would be, you know, having a social media presence or building a website or, uh, you know, having an idea of when you're going to release singles or creating a music video, those, those aren't your goals. Those are just items that support your goals. So begin with the hard and fast goals first, and then start connecting them by creating strategies and tactics that support those things. So a lot of people use this particular acronym SMART, like, oh, you got to have SMART goals. You know, SMART goals are goals that are specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, uh, they're, they're relevant and they're time bound. So th these are different attributes for it. I like to say goals ought to actually be smarter uh, because uh, for those of us, especially if you're working in the world of music, you probably got a team. You probably got collaborators and bandmates. So I think I add the E and the R. E stands for everyone. It's got to involve everybody on your team. They have to be on board. They have to be fully vested in your goals. And I would also include some of the people that maybe you don't think about as part of your crew, but actually are. For example, a significant other. If you have a serious relationship and they're not on board with you being gone six months out of the year, eight months out of the year on tour, or dropping all of your income on upgrading equipment, then you're going to have a problem in achieving your goals. So you got to make sure that people are fully vested. Uh, and, and that means your, your close circle as well as the team that's directly working on your goals. And finally, that, that last R, it's got to be revisited often. So remember, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. So like a, actually put it on the calendar involves everybody and the revisited often. And I'll give you kind of an example of this. So when I teach entrepreneurship classes with folks, I kind of have this exercise. We won't necessarily dive into all these aspects of it uh, at the moment, but I kind of, I'll give you a quick walkthrough. Um, when I meet with students, I always say, okay, let's, uh, let's say we have a goal and that's to build a business and where you earn $10,000 in the next 30 days. And I always ask them like, okay, what are you going to do to do this? How are you going to um, get to 10K? And give them 10 or 15 minutes to brainstorm just within their little teams of like three to five people of like what skills they have within the, within the group, what, what uh, interests they have, what relationships they have and say, okay, how are you going to get to this 10K mark? And what I find is that um, for a lot of folks, they begin again with the actions right? Because it's the obvious thing like, oh, I play music. I make, I make movies. I do this. Let's create these products. Uh, instead of thinking about the goal and working backwards, let's say you had a group of uh, five people 
and this was your particular goal. You know, an easier way to get at it is thinking like, if you got to make $10,000 in a month, then what do you got to do? You have to make a certain amount every single day, right? And if you, if the goal was 10K, that, that would amount to $333 um, a, a day, right? Uh, so let's say that's, that's your target, but you had five people. If you actually divide it up where everyone's responsible for an equal share of that, then that means everyone's got to bring in about $66 a day. Now, all of a sudden, this $10,000 number, which seems pretty massive, isn't that bad. Because if you're, if you're a musician, that's selling like a couple of t-shirts and a CD, right? And if you could figure out a way to do that, that's, that's maybe like part of a gig. It, it, like if everyone could contribute to making that happen, all of a sudden you have a six figure business. So when you begin at the goal, you can begin thinking of particular pathways or revenue streams of getting at this goal instead of focusing on the revenue streams themselves, because then you're working towards an unidentifiable target. But you know the, the thing is, if you aim at nothing, if you don't have a sp specific goal, then you're going to hit nothing every single time. It's much more important to have like a ambitious goal where you can create a plan to get behind it. And this is the same with social media. So maybe if your, your goal is to get say a uh, thousand fans a month, right? Then you can think, okay, what are the things I need to do to get 33 people engaged every single day to a point where they see value in following me? Uh, this was something that I helped uh, um, one of the artists who was uh, being mentored by the Slants Foundation this past uh, this last summer, he, he told me he wanted to grow his fan base uh, by a thousand fans over a period of a few months. We figured out that it, for him, that meant 15 to 20 minutes of very specific activities per day. And he actually found out he had some additional uh, capacity and appetite for this. So what ended up happening over the six month period that we kind of determined this goal was he actually grew his channel by 500%. On top of that, he was able to launch a, a YouTube channel and get hundreds and hundreds of followers there as well. So a lot of times, you know, we get intimidated by these numbers, but if you're very focused, you can kind of figure out a specific plan in achieving these particular things. This is the, the deal here. Like, don't spend your time on social media. Don't spend your time, money on ads. Invest do things that provide a very, very specific return on investment. And again, one that serves this larger goal. Uh, otherwise, you're wasting that time and money. And ultimately, you should be thinking about value. And that's why it's important to be very selective about which social media channels you use or which websites you use and how you interact with those particular things, because you want to be making sure that you have this kind of bigger picture goal in mind. You know, one of these quotes that I really love uh, from, from Jim Rohn is like the rich invest their money and they spend what's left. The poor spend their money and they invest in what's left. If your art is your primary goal, then you need to be investing the time and resources into it first and foremost. Everything else is, is being spent instead of like, oh, I got a pocket of time. I got 10 minutes here. I got 20 minutes there. I got an hour. You, you, these are decisive decisions that we make. And for, for a long time, um, my, you know, a lot of folks would ask me, like, how do you, how do, you do all these things? Do you, do you sleep at night? Because um, when I started actually teaching this kind of a webinar for marketing companies, this was in the late, uh, like 2010s, or like mid, like 2013, 2014. I was actually working two full-time jobs in a full-time MBA program touring full-time in a band, uh, writing a book and managing two nonprofits at the same time. And I was like, and, and people used to say like, how do you do this all? And I would kind of joke around and say, well, I, I don't have kids and I don't have Netflix, which you know, I didn't have either at the time. But the reality is I, I just kind of made those decisions. I prioritized things and like said, okay, everything else that's for fun, that's, that's the stuff that's being spent. But everything, the things that are critical for me to grow in this moment that's the stuff that's being uh, invested. That's getting prioritized. Remember, the key to social media is not money. It's actually time. It's, it's investing time into it. And just like uh, a plant, 
or anything else that requires things, it requires concentration, it requires consistency. You know, here's the thing. Um, let's say you wanted to, to get in shape and you're really, really serious about this, you're really passionate about it. And you, you sign up and you go to the gym and let's say you work out for 15 hours straight. Guess what? You're not gonna be in shape. You're probably gonna be really sore and hurt if anything else and burnt out and unable to continue working out because in order for it to work, you gotta go consistently you, and you gotta work out strategically. But the key is that consistency part over a long period of time. No one knows how long it really takes to get fit. Some people might promise that it's gonna take a month. Some people might say it's a year, two years of working out to get in a particular shape. Uh, we just know it's probably somewhere in between all of that. But the only thing we know is that you could only get in shape if you work out consistently over a long period of time. And that's the key to growing a social media channel as well. As, as same thing, it's like if you had a plant, you could dump a year's worth of water on a plant and it will kill it. But if you just divide up a little bit over time, specifically space it out so it has time to breathe and grow, then theoretically it'll flourish. Unless it's in my house, then it'll probably be dead anyway. So understand that this is consistency and persistence is a very, very important thing. And it's gonna be consistent throughout this particular presentation. Um, a lot of times I say, don't just go by what you feel like is working, know what actually works. I believe in using the scientific method to evaluate things. Like there's a lot of people who say, oh, you gotta do this. Like you gotta trend on Instagram by hitting up these certain hashtags, or you gotta go on this particular channel, or this is the way you should format a video. I'm like, it might work for that one particular person in that one moment, but I, I'm always about looking at big picture. So one of my favorite resources for this is called the Social Media Lab by Agora Pulse. And what they do is uh, Agora Pulse is a social media management and social media um, scheduling company. Like you can post to any channel through it and, and they you know help you evaluate when to post and that sort of thing. And they actually help run um, like something like 50 to 60,000 social media accounts. So they're always running these tests. And what they do is they say they apply the scientific method and say, okay, how many hashtags should you really have on an Instagram post? Hint, it's actually 30. Use every single one. And should you put them in the comments or should you put it in the post? Well, according to them, you should put it in the post. Uh, so on and so forth. And they, they just evaluate thousands and thousands of times to test it and over and over again. And they change up the variables to make sure that what works works universally across the board. So it's one of my favorite resources for understanding social, particularly as algorithms change, which we know happens all the freaking time. And for yourself, always continue testing, but test against your smarter goals. Think, is this actually leading to those objectives that I outlined? Or are they just leading to vanity metrics? Vanity metrics, of course, would be things like, do I got more followers? Do I got more likes on this post than that post? Honestly, I could care less about followers or likes. I care about selling albums. I care about reaching people, right? And so you got to think like, are they clicking through? Are they leading to some you know, bigger goal of mine in order to kind of funnel the career? You can't make a living just off of likes, right? Even influencers got to get paid by having people pay for that content. So like make sure your metrics are serving those smarter goals that you're revisiting them on, on a regular basis. All right, so let's talk about the, the practical stuff, very specific steps that you can take. <clears throat> Number one, treat social media more like a telephone and less like a megaphone. A lot of times people love social media because they're like, oh, great. If I'm a musician, if I'm an artist, I could talk about myself. That is, that's not how it works. Like people want to see stuff that they can see themselves in. They want to be able to engage with it. So do things that encourage interaction and engagement. That also means if you're really serious about the craft on a regular basis, interacting with those people who that follow you and, and not just on your own posts, like via the comments, that means going to their particular accounts as well. Uh, Maximo, the artist that we had been mentoring over the past summer, one of the cool things that he did was he'd followed specific hashtags, found new accounts of people who he thought might have a shared interest in, 
And whenever they did follow, uh, followed each other, he would immediately send them a voice memo. It's very quick and easy. He sent it, it was personalized and he would just introduce himself every single time individually. His engagement shot through the roof. And, you know, he was kind of frustrated in the beginning of the process. He was like, well, I only get like 10 to 50 videos, um, uh, video views on my YouTube channel. I don't know if it's even worth it. And I was like, well, if, like anything else, just like that plant metaphor, it takes persistence. And I was like, you got to post new content every single week. Give them a reason to go to your YouTube channel, first of all. But you also got to direct people there. You know, he was starting to blow up on Instagram because of this particular uh, tactic. So I said, why not, when you're leaving voicemails, say, by the way, I got a video. I would love for you to check it out. And I'm trying this out. I would love to hear your feedback. And guess what? His YouTube blew up. He actually was able to multiply video views by 10, 20 fold. So started went from like 10 to 50 views to hundreds of views to thousands of views with the video retention rate very, very high because he would take the feedback from fans and apply it immediately in these things he called song diaries, which was like a look into the making of his music. It was fantastic. Remember, the, the reason why you want to treat it more like a telephone and less like a megaphone is because that's the whole point of social media. It's supposed to be social. You know, I think, how can you build a community through this? Like, what are those things? What are those touch points? And, you know, I, I, we'll give more into it in a minute, but this is really how you work around algorithms. Uh, and this is how you work around trends that go up and down. If you're able to build a community, then that is the kind of the golden approach. Okay. Another thing is to use their tools. Whenever social media sites uh, change, and we know they're changing all the freaking time, and they launch new particular tools or features, if you want to be featured, if you want to increase the chance of being discovered, like jump on it, use it all the time. So, you know, every, everyone knows, like you've, you've heard of TikTok. Well, Instagram, uh, which is owned by Facebook, they don't like to be outdone. So they launch reels and the, the right now, if you want to get, you, you increase your chances of being featured on Instagram, you use reels. Like when they launch stories as a response to Snapchat, guess what? Every, all that content that started getting kind of pushed were people were, that were using stories. And so right now reels, and in particular, they have to be original reels to Instagram. You can't be reusing your TikTok video for it because Instagram actually doesn't like that so much. So that, that's one particular thing. Or uh, Facebook, they're always offering new layouts to people, right? So they, they launch Facebook TV, Facebook Watch, and they actually allow you to create a, a profile template that where you could either be a business, you could be a public figure, or you can be a video creator. If you're able to pull off creating videos on a regular basis, whether they're lyric videos, whether they're blog videos, live performances, streams, whatever, switch to the video creator because that's what Facebook is trying to promote right now. They're trying to compete against YouTube. And anytime a social media site is launching a new feature to compete against a competitor, whether it's existing or uh, one that's up and coming, uh, you better believe that those new tools are things that they're going to try and feature and encourage people to use. So, um, you know, I, I, a number of you probably were invited to try out like Facebook's dark mode beforehand. And, and, and there's all these other kinds of things that they're launching. But if you're in that beta group, use it, adapt it, learn it as much as you can, because sooner or later, they're going to roll it out across the board. And if you're on it, uh, then you're more likely to be featured and also the, the algorithm is going to prefer landing on your particular site. Also, don't give up your ownership. At the end of the day, your owned content rules. You know, I kind of mentioned the fact uh, very briefly that sometimes social media companies are up, sometimes they disappear altogether. At the end of the day, you want to be able to own all of the content and you want to be able to own as much of the contact information as possible. I know it's a it's very popular right now for musicians and artists to have social media and not a website, but this is a, actually a huge mistake. The number one thing you could do if you want to appeal to labels, to licensing partners, uh, if you want to attract a sponsorship or endorsement deal is to have the biggest and most robust email list that you can get. That means having information, uh, as much information as possible, like first and last names, mailing addresses, age, 
a phone number and so on. And the other reason for this is because if you're putting all your eggs in the social media basket and all of a sudden that channel isn't cool anymore or your audience has moved on, then you just lost a huge part of your audience. I mean, you know, I remember when I was starting to really get into social media like 15 years ago and everyone's like, there's no way that MySpace is going away. I mean, MySpace, because of them, we got Tila Tequila, Far East Movement, they blew up on there. Like, how could it ever disappear? And when Facebook was coming up, people are like, no, that's only for college kids. It's like invite only, no one cares about that. But guess what happened? All those artists who dropped having their own websites because they, they just directed their URLs back to MySpace, they lost all those fans, all that time they spent on there. They, they were giving MySpace that free information. MySpace was profiting off of their fans and they weren't even able to profit off their own fans. So don't do that. Find a way to get people back to stuff that you own, that you control. And, and, and that's part of, that should be a part of one of those overarching goals you have. No matter how much you might be trending on a particular social media site, it is never enough to give up ownership to, of your fans to that site. Like get people onto your uh, site, give them a reason to visit, incentivize them and, and realize that that's going to allow you to scale. It's going to allow you to be sustainable. Okay, one of the things that if, for those of you who are uploading videos to YouTube that you can do to help with your website is make sure every single one, and this is across the board, make sure your videos are captioned. Like not just like you go in with a video editor and have captions on the video for your lyrics or like if you're doing a video blog or something like that, actually upload the transcript file to the, the channels themselves. Uh, most people who are watching videos, particularly on Instagram and Facebook, are watching it with the sound off anyway. So you want to have those captions going on. Uh, but the more important thing is YouTube is owned by Google. And if you have your transcripts in there, they're ca captioned, uh, Google will index that in. I mean, if you ever notice, like if you try and Google something, especially like a how to something, they tend to put YouTube videos up on top before they get into articles like that. That's kind of the search prioritization of Google. This is something that I was able to do for uh, a client of mine a number of years ago when I was doing marketing for for colleges. The it was a local local community college in Oregon who was launching a nursing program, and they're like, "Well, we want to do some some paid advertisements and that sort of thing." They gave me a budget of thirty thousand dollars, and I was like, "You know, thirty thousand dollars." is nothing I, when you compare to the fact that at that time, University of Phoenix was dropping $45 million on search. <laughs> uh, you know, Keller was 40 million. So I, I was like, this, you're not, you, you can't compete with them on paid advertisement, but we can compete with them on is on content. And so what we did was we just filmed tons of videos, tons of interview videos, because that's rich with tons of spoken text that I could create captions for. We embedded uh, videos about nursing, about education, about degree programs in there. And then we destroyed every other for-profit university, like 10 to one without spending a single cent. So these are some really interesting ways that you can work around the system if you understand like how the system works. Google loves searching for things that they own. And if you can maximize on that, particularly through YouTube by captioning, making sure you have the appropriate tags and descriptions in your videos, you can drive a lot more traffic to your website. Uh, another thing that you can do to kind of lead folks to your own content is to be a resource. Like think about how you can give value. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Like you can, you know, um, for example, a lot of people search queries on the internet uh, by question. You can write blogs that specifically answer those questions. You can go on people's websites and answer those questions. Uh, there's a couple other ways to do this. Uh, for example, uh, one of my favorite resources, if you're not on this, like everyone get this URL down. It's called helpareporter.com. That's what HERO stands for, help a reporter out. Uh, what this is, it's a database of journalists that are looking for sources. Um, and what they do, you'll see if you sign up for this, you can kind of, you can do a free account, by the way. So it doesn't mean cost you anything. Three times a day, you'll get emails about reporters who are looking for someone to interview. And it could be about anything. It could be about, um, you know, 
the presidential inauguration. Uh, like for example, most recently they were looking for people who like to teach poetry to other people. Washington Post was, uh, they, they were like sourcing people for this. It could be about entertainment. It could be about their favorite ways you celebrate Christmas, whatever it is. You just kind of look at this email. And if you see something, you're like, hey, I think I could speak to that. You answer in a quick pitch back to the journalist, usually four lines or so. And unless they have a full interview, uh, but that'll lead them to following up with you so that you can get featured in their particular magazine, TV show, and so on. Uh, it's one of the best resources out there with, that you can uh, get press without hiring a publicist. I, I've used Tarot probably for about 10 years now, and I probably have gotten at least a thousand uh, newspaper features just through this alone. And I get as creative as possible. So for example, a number of years ago, um, Travel and Leisure Magazine was looking for people who had been to Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, uh, Brooklyn, and they just wanted to, it, it was for an article called America's Best Cities for Hipsters. And I was like, yo, I live in Portland, Oregon. This is like the number one hipster city. And I shared with them a story wrapped around my band. I was like, yeah, like one example of it being a hipster city was one night uh, after my show, I was on the street while a man dressed like a taco was rolling by on rollerblades with a boom box. They loved this story so much that it became their top story. And so our band was on the cover of Travel and Leisure magazine. That got picked up by Yahoo Travel. That got picked up by, um, like five other travel magazines. And it's just like this really simple thing, like never in the world would I have thought like they're gonna talk about our band, but they just thought it was such a funny story that they link back to it. And then they link to our music. So you never know where it can end up. Um, this is great, especially if you have some kind of uh, skill, some kind of knowledge in a very particular area. So check it out. Another thing is to work with smart speakers and virtual assistants. I mean, these days, how many people search by talking to the phone? Like, hey, Siri, you know, they'll ask a question or, okay, Google, we, you know, these are the things. So you can figure out like, what are those sources of information that these smart speakers like to pull from? Well, I'll tell you one of the number one things is Wikipedia. If you learn how to become a Wikipedia contributor and editor, oftentimes uh, editing the first few lines Particularly, I mean, it has to be in service of the article, but if there's something that's related to your work or you create a Wikipedia entry about yourself that could speak to aspects of what makes you stand out, then you're gonna be more likely to be found through virtual assistants. Again, this is just content that you can help control that you're not kind of dependent on social from, but social media and social sites actually use that content to help kind of find uh, information. And as you're kind of going through this process, you could also rethink how you can treat partnerships, how you can build coalitions. Uh, for example, this artist think tank is one of them, like just finding other artists that you could connect with on a regular basis, collaborate with, um, supporting each other to help drive that engagement on your social so that everybody's content gets seen. That's one way of doing it. Another is thinking about the same tactics and applying it to real life partnership, like if you want to get a corporate sponsorship, an endorsement deal, and so on. And finally, um, learning to hashtag properly. So there's a lot of different ways to, to go about like using hashtags. A lot of people have different ideas for this. I'll tell you one of the more common ones is uh, if you don't want to sit there and do 30 hashtags every single time, because I know that's like a pain, you could begin with 12 and think about it in categories of four, like a 444 method. You want four hashtags that are pretty niche. Like as you're searching for it, you got about 50,000 people or so using the thing, like less, 50,000 or less. Then you got the medium category, like maybe 50,000 to like 200,000 people using this particular hashtag. Then the large one, which would be like, you know, half a million on up. The reason why you do this is because Instagram no longer set, shows content on a chronological basis. They're doing it by their algorithm, by engagement. If you start trending in a smaller ha um, hashtag category, which is a lot easier to do, they'll bump you up. You're more likely to get featured. And if you get featured there, then you're more likely to be found in that kind of medium hashtag pop, uh, category in terms of popularity. And finally, if that does really well, 
then you're more likely to be displayed on the home page when people are searching the more commonly searched for hashtags. If you're only using the, the super popular hashtags, you're probably going to get drowned out and killed by other people who are doing this. So this is just a quick and easy way of doing that. Uh, but another thing is just learning how hashtags work across the board. For example, if you use LinkedIn, like just knowing that LinkedIn, you only want to use like one, maybe three hashtags at the very most. You don't want to drown it out because then their algorithm will start actually pushing your content down. And kind of most importantly, as you're kind of creating content, you want to make your audience feel something. Here's the thing about social. Nobody wants to like your content. That's boring. Like think about the other emotions that are available on that Facebook emotional response wheel. You wanna make people go, wow. You wanna make people feel angry, sad. You wanna make them laugh. Like that's the kind of content that spreads. So if, if you're just like, I have a new album coming out, people are gonna be like, nah, I like that, right? That's not that exciting. But if you're like, well, I, I'm so excited about this album that you've helped contribute to. Here's the reasons why. That's gonna be a wow thing. Or like, uh, actually, ironically I, I didn't choose this on purpose but like the photo in the background here was when our band was touring across Taiwan and we went to the Hello Kitty cafe and like I posted this picture it was just kind of a goofy picture normally we just post pictures of us playing at shows but people went bananas over it they loved it they're like oh they thought it was really funny and then I showed pictures of like the tofu that they cut and shapes of the Hello Kitty head and people all about that like make people feel something because that's that's where the content's really good. I mean, you could see it in the news cycle even. Like the, the news is designed to piss you off because that's when people actually like leave comments and it's like, can you, can you feel what's happening here? They get enraged, they take action. Um, and for better or for worse, they found that content uh, that has enraging words, like uh, you can't just say like, I'm, un, I'm not pleased with what Trump is doing. That's gonna do, Eh. But if you say I'm pissed off because Trump is like destroying lives, that like inflammatory language, it's actually more likely to get engagement like by 500%. It's insane because people can connect with that. They say, okay, this is a human being. It's not just a robot. Like nobody wants to interact with a press release, right? Or like a robotic announcement. They want to have something that connects the humanity that they and, and the emotions that they're feeling with the content they're interacting with. This is also the same reason why stories matter. So when I talked about like connecting your social to that larger picture or objective, this is one of the ways you can do it. You could think about what is the story that you're trying to tell? I know a number of you here mentioned that you're in a film or you're acting or you, you, you engage with other kinds of content in that particular way. Like think like of a, your social media or the channels you own as if it were a story arc. If someone were to chart it out over the, say the course of a month, what would that story be? Would it just be one announcement after another? Would it be a plug for yourself all the time? Or would it tell a story, like say a particular struggle that has a beginning, a middle and some kind of resolution? <coughs> you, can, you can create these arcs by planning out your content in advance, or maybe it's the course of a quarter or a whole year. If you're working on a particular project, like you're about to drop an album, you're and you know, like, okay, the end point is like, this album is going to get released in June. What can you do to start planting the scenes for that now? So people start thinking about that content. You know, you, you could create a behind the scenes video vignette. You could talk about songs that you're writing in the moment or content that feeds that. And then you build up to that particular point so that when you actually deliver that ending, that resolution or that call to action, has a much greater impact than if it just seemed like a one-off post one after another. You know, the, this is the reason why Netflix and all these streaming companies have started back series instead of like films, because if it's a series, it's telling one long story. You want to stay on that channel as much as you can. You want to come back. You want to tune back in because you want to know what happens next. You don't even want to miss a single episode. The same thing should be the content that you're providing on your social platforms. You want to be delivering content in a way that uh, feeds this larger narrative that people can't wait to watch or be resolved or to be a part of. You can podcast if you want or don't. Remember, I, I'm not a fan of just doing things just to do them. 
But I will say that podcasting is an opportunity. It is a type of social media because you can engage with folks in a, in a number of ways. If you care about industry, this is actually a really, really cool way to, um, to, to, to actually get industry connections. Um, you know, you, if you, particularly if you do interview shows. And that's because publicists that represent artists and industry people are looking for places to interview all the time. When I launched my podcast, it started out like very, very uh, humbly, just a couple dozen people listening to it. And, you know, because it was getting good reviews and kind of gaining momentum. And because I knew a couple of initial contacts to kind of gain momentum, I was able to build it up to a point where publicists were pitching me. So that's how I got to um, interview people like one of the founders of the Radar Label Group, you know, who worked with the Plain White Tees. That's how I got Snoop Dogg's manager to work with me on my book. That's how um, P. Diddy asked me to help run his like tour campaign for sponsorships. Like this all came from developing regular content. Um, and the reason why I think my music business podcast took off in ways uh, very, very quickly was because I decided to do it in a way that was very different than everyone else. Most people were just doing a podcast that was like a long form interview, maybe once a week. I committed to making a daily show every single day. I cranked this thing out, especially when I was on tour. Like I, uh, there's, you know, probably like 10 episodes where I'm in an airport and you can hear everything in the background. I'm like, I, I promise. <laughs> and I made all the episodes like very short because everyone else is doing the long stuff. So I was like, I'll do short stuff. And I'll, every single day will be like, if you don't know what to do, here's what to work on, here are the steps to do it. And it, it, it took off and it went really, uh, you know, I think I did like close to 400 episodes and then took a break, just relaunching it now. But like, again, this, this is just like, whatever you choose to do, do it with persistence, do it in a way that positions yourself differently and do it because it fits your style of who you are and the kind of things that you wanna share in the world. But don't do something just to do it or because you see somebody else doing it. Like, remember your uniqueness, the stuff that makes you, you, that's your greatest strength. Not how well you copy someone else's strategy, not how well you copy someone else's art. Like think about what makes you unique, how you could be uniquely positioned to do stuff. And that's how you can actually leverage all these channels to meet those particular goals. So that was a lot of like really high level kind of stuff. I'm gonna dive into more specific content uh, more and examples of how we applied these things. So it'll start kind of gelling a little bit more. Uh, number one, uh, make them feel something. So a number of years ago, I was running social media for Portland Community College. It's the, one of the largest colleges in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they had something called the uh, alert system where basically you could sign up so that if you, you know, if there's a weather alert, power was out, if there was a, an emergency of some sort, you would automatically get a text message. And so like you didn't come to, come to class. Like it was just for, for students, faculty and community members. Well, I was actually on vacation when this particular message hit. It was one of the biggest snowstorms that Portland had in a very, very long time. Uh, the vice president of communications created this post, said PCC campuses and centers are closed Sunday, February 9th. All classes and events are canceled. Then there's a link to the alert system because they're trying to get people to sign up for this thing. Now, if you look at the numbers here, 13 people are like, yes, classes are canceled. One person left a comment, there's one share. Uh, you can see 49 people saw this post. Now, keep in mind, this college serves 93,000 students a year. 49 people seeing that post, this is by any measure, a complete failure, like this is a wreck, right? My mom's Facebook post gets more like than this thing. And this is a major institution. So I found out about what was happening and I tuned in from uh, New York where I was staying. And then I put this particular post up. I said, traffic reports from around town are saying it's pretty bad. Stay safe and warm out there. And then I put a picture of an at, -AT walker because I love Star Wars, uh, walking across the freeway and uh, posted it. And then I screen capped this 30 minutes later. So what happened? In 30 minutes, we got 258 likes, 24 comments, 486 shares. And then if you look at the bottom left corner, you'll see almost 33,000 people saw this post. Keep in mind, only about 5,000 were following the college channel at this particular time. So, you know, 
over 600% more people saw it than were actually following the channel. And in those shares, people were bragging that this is the college that they were attending to, which not a lot of people were bragging that they went to the community college, but people were really all about this. Even the, the, the city mayor shared this particular post. So what's different? Number one, you could probably notice there's actually nothing useful in this post. There's no information about whether we are actually closed or not. That's because uh, I wanted to get people just to feel something. Second of all, I wanted to engage with people. So people were like the, the comments down below, they were like, wait, are you actually open? And that's when I was able to say, oh, you should sign up for the alert system. Then you would have known. And uh, you, know, you get the most up-to-date information again and again. So we were actually able to, uh, I was able to triple the number of people subscribed to our emergency alert system in a single day. More people in one day signed up than they had for almost five years of having the system out by having this particular post. That's the power of making people feel something because if they want to engage with it, they will. And they'll get really psyched about it and you'll get these unbelievable results. Again, I did this kind of thing right around finals week. Um, you know, in the beginning said, welcome to finals week, had this lovely picture of a student taking a nap in the library. And again, hundreds and hundreds of people liked it, 34 people shared it. And people just thought it was funny and amusing. And they're like, wait, can you actually sleep in the library? I'm like, no, it's not 24 seven, but here's some alumni owned coffee shops in the area that are. And I was able to direct people back to it. Or uh, the next day I said, happy finals week. We may, may the odds be ever in your favor, right? Um, the, the movie was blown up at the time. So it, it just was seem fitting and just hundreds of people engaged with it. And you know, even the person down there said, wow, why do I feel like we're all gonna die now? And I just decided like, if you're gonna commit to a meme, you gotta commit all the way. So I said, hey, just respect the mahogany and you'll be fine. Of course, little reference to Hunger Games film itself. And people really, really love this. In fact, uh, over the course of the next few months, I did similar content on a regular basis on the college's channel, like a total left turn from like, it's very academic and stoic kind of position that had taken before. But I was like, we've got to meet students where they are and uh, won several uh, awards for this and national uh, marketing competitions. So like, and on top of that, like we were able to blow up in terms of getting people to attend the college. Enrollment went through the roof. The school got a lot of notoriety, which again, tying up those bigger pictures, that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to provide services. You know, I was able to pr promote tutoring services through these particular things because it was giving them more attention in life than they otherwise would have gotten than if we were to like say, you get free tutoring at the library. Content always matters more than anything else. Well, people would try and tell you things like, oh, you gotta keep things short or you gotta post it this time of day or that, or like whatever it might be, like those things can help you. But at the end of the day, you gotta give people something that they care about, something that they really want to engage with. This is an example of something when we were like, uh, like re really excited about touring Taiwan. And I was like, hey, you know, here's a, a giving campaign for it again. like. Our, our post normally didn't get like more than say 20, 30 likes, maybe 50 likes if it was a pretty good one. This one got almost 700. And it wasn't because I used some kind of trick like posting a bunch of memes. I posted a link to a generosity site, but I kind of told this particular story through this. People, it really resonated with them and they said, yeah. And they were able to su support and, and saw themselves as being a part of that particular film. So don't worry about things like length and those other tricks. Engage with people how you're able to, but most of all, create content that they themselves care about. The, again, you wanna like narrow your focus as much as time because you wanna invest. You don't wanna just spend time. And this includes narrowing down on having a very specific audience that you're trying to reach. So uh, whenever I do mentoring programs with artists, probably the first activity or second activity that I have them do is I have them write a biography for a fan. Cause I say like, you know, who, who's your audience? If you, if you're saying you, if you answer the question of who your audience is with a demographic range, you already lost it. Right. You can't say like, Oh, my, my audience is like 15 to 30, 30 year olds who like, um, you know, metal or something like that, because, most 15 year olds are nothing like 30 year olds or even 20 year olds. 
most 15 year olds aren't even like other 15 year olds. People are very unique and particular. So I say like, instead find out that single fan, like who is the person that is the most excited about your music, the most excited about everything that you're doing, the, the person that wants to like, just go nuts for everything that you do. That's your target audience. Then you figure out what defines that person. Like what are the channels they use? How do they consume music? How do they discover things? How do they get news? How do they connect with their friends? And you connect with them in, in that particular way. So if you narrow your focus, you can narrow your focus down to like a super fan, then you're on the right track because then you can expand slowly from there. And that's what I mean by like focus on niche markets. If you have a very specific objective, like you have a goal in mind, uh, let, let's say you have a target that you're trying to hit. What's more effective at hitting a target, a shotgun or a laser? It's going to be that laser. It's going to be fo focus. It's going to be precision, not something where you're just throwing out a bunch of content and trying to hit as many people as possible. That's like trying to just throw a bunch of social media posts across many, many different channels, hoping that it'll eventually land and maybe one of them will be viral. Like that's not going to get you to your goals. But if you're very, very specific in the terms of the type of person you're trying to reach and the method in reaching them, you're going to be much more likely to hit that particular target. All right, so let's talk about more specifically away from higher education and how I was able to do it with my own band. Again, niche audience. I'll give you one uh, particular example of this. Um, a number of years ago, we had filmed this music video for a song called You Make Me Alive. Uh, at the time, our band was actually playing at a ton of anime conventions. Uh, you know, that was something that I started in 2007 at, way before anyone was touring anime conventions. Like people thought I was crazy for this, but I was like, no, there's thousands of geeky white kids obsessed with Asian culture. Like we ought to be there. And I used to build entire tours around them because, you know, we would fly out and play for like 10, 15,000 kids and sell a ton of merchandise. And that would help offset us playing at like dive bars and punk rock clubs where like maybe a couple dozen people showed up. Uh, that was our audience. Like it was one of our core things. And we were excited about this new music video. And my, my publicist, Alex, was like, oh, you know, we could shop it around. Maybe um, we'll get an alternative press. I'll, I'll pitch it to uh, Spin Magazine and things like that. And I was like, no, that's not the audience for this. Because the, the music video was actually like a karaoke video where we got beat up by a bunch of kids in cosplay, like dressed up as their favorite anime and video game characters. I was like, the crowd for this should be like, the anime crowd. I was like, I want to debut this thing on a cosplay website. And of course, Alex is just like, are you, what are you talking about? You're a band, you're not a cosplaying group. And I was like, no, but, but that's the right audience. That's who we're trying to reach. That's why we even filmed this whole video. And so I, I made a bet with him. I was like, just give me this video. You can do whatever you want with the next video. But if this takes off, then you'll know that this is the right way to, to go about things. So we launched a video on a cosplay website. <clears throat> At the time, it was considered viral. We got like 250,000 views in uh, just two months. Nowadays, that's like nothing. <laughs> but, but like at the time, it caught a lot of fire. And because we got so many views in such a short amount of time, Conan O'Brien called us up and we're like, hey, we want the slants. But it wasn't just that because Ryan Seacrest called up and said like, we want the slants. And so they were bidding each other to get our next video. Uh, ultimately Conan won because, you know, he's way cooler than Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> but so, so we were able to debut that next video on um, Conan O'Brien's show. And that's the power of like truly understanding your audience. Like, yeah, we, if we got that video place on like a music website, we could have gotten some traction. Maybe it would have done okay, but we never would have gotten that Conan track, right? Because it would probably wouldn't have caught fire in the same kind of way because like the audience understood what we were doing and it was clear that we got them in that way too. That's the power of like really understanding who you are because when you do that, when people see themselves in the work that you do, they're more likely to see themselves as part of your community and not just a fan just that's passively consuming or streaming your music, but someone who's a part of like your army, someone who's part of your fan base to like, because your success is something that they want to see materialized. And that's when they begin doing things like sharing on your behalf and telling that everyone else, you got to support this particular act. 
this is also how you could build uh, partnerships because when you really understand a niche audience, when you understand who you're trying to serve, you can get relationships in ways that people who are just using a shotgun approach never could. Um, I shared this with the first artist think tank that, you know, a uh, couple months when we, after we launched our particular band, uh, before, just right around the time period, we just had an album out and barely anything else, like maybe six shows under our feet. I pitched Fender Music, uh, the largest music instrument company in the world, and ended up getting them as a partner for the slants because I just said, hey, how many, how many Asian disco punk bands can you name? We're playing anime conventions. Like you got a Hello Kitty guitar. What are you doing to promote yourself at anime conventions? They couldn't answer that. So they're like, okay, how can we get anime conventions on board? And I was like, we're already touring them. We're playing them. We could, you know, and we were able to create contests and giveaways and, and really create a valuable win-win partnership for us. This is the same thing with G-Sake. G-Sake is a, was, um, at the time, the only sake company in North America that was actually owned by non-Japanese people, like by North Americans, founded by a Japanese family. And they kind of saw themselves as this mix of Asian American culture. And I was like, well, that sounds like a perfect partnership because we work with the Asian American community. And we had this great relationship with G-Sake where not only did they help fund our tours every single year, but they gave us like a ridiculous amount of sake. I, I mean, serious, I don't know. Like we would, it's not always a good idea, but they would load up our van's trailer and we'd have like a hundred bottles of this thing uh, going on tour. So we'd give them to uh, friends and family. We'd cook, with, we'd do all kinds of wild things with them. But like when you really understand who you're trying to reach um, and, and you, and you got to lock on that particular audience, chances are someone else is gonna to wanna to get in on that audience as well. Anyone could buy blanket ads that just cost a ton of money, like a Super Bowl ad, but very few people can reach fans in a unique way if you have a very established, incredible relationship with that audience. Oftentimes I say like, you know, you're a creative, right? You're an artist. So ask yourself, is your business creative? Are you putting the same level of creativity into you, the business of how you market yourself as you do into writing songs or acting or uh, uh, your, your performances? Because like you would never just copy someone else's material. Like that, that doesn't actually make you unique. Same thing goes for, for these approaches. There are certainly best practices you can learn from, but like have fun with it, play with it and make sure your personality is popping throughout it especially in a way that connects with that particular audience. I'll give you a, another kind of example of this. Um, you know, a number of years ago, I thought like, hey, what's something that our band is like really into? And I was like, oh, it's food. Like we love food. We're always like talking about what we're eating. And I remember one time we were kind of just trying to decide between playing in St. Louis or playing in Chicago when I was working on my tour route. And I was like, yeah, but St. Louis, they got one of the restaurants on Anthony Bourdain's 13 places to eat before you die list. So we got to go there. That's how much we love food. Like that we, I would book tours specifically around places that had my favorite restaurants. So where are the foodies? Well, of course it's on Yelp, right? So I, I created this Yelp page. This is a snapshot from a number of years ago. And I just started writing reviews in different cities wherever we are on tour like our favorite restaurants and then i would kind of say like hey if you like this review um i play in a band we're always eating on the road you can download the song for free and it was actually the song you make me life that that i mentioned um that we got the the music video for and just by doing this on a consistent basis actually led to forty-five thousand downloads of our song insane and so I was like, oh, wow, that, that worked out really well. Uh, so I just kind of continued doing that. But then I also realized that, oh, my goodness, like uh, we had this kind of best of restaurants guide come out in Portland, Oregon uh, by a, a local newspaper. I think it was the Portland Mercury. And none of the restaurants that were on there for Asian food were actually in where, where the Asian community was. They're all like downtown. They're centralized. Most of them weren't even owned or cooked by Asian people. So I was like, that that review guide sucks. We're going to write our own. So we created the Slants Guide to Asian Eating in Portland. And as I promoted it on Yelp, but actually 
printed physical copies and I took them to all these restaurants and they're like, hey, you're in our guide. And then we took our 10 favorite restaurants and I, I spent 30 bucks on this whole campaign, by the way, $30 uh, for copies and then buying window clings, uh, like those stickers that you see on the windows of restaurants. And I said, they're on the best of the best guide from the slants and had our website and, and stuck them on our 10 favorite restaurants. And we, we promoted this thing and, and again, promoted the song. This led to over 90,000 downloads, but even better, I started getting free food when I walked into all these restaurants. So like, you know, it was amazing to see how we could actually start building out these particular community groups. If, if you were to tell anyone, especially during this time before I even um, kind of proved that it was possible that I was like, yo, I'm gonna promote my music on Yelp. People would be like, what a waste of time. How come you're not on, you know, Instagram? How come you're not on Facebook? I'm like, because our, the audience I'm trying to reach are foodies. Like, that's what they care about. I'm just gonna go where they are. And you could, there was a, for a while, they had community boards on Yelp and we would promote shows whenever we were in town. It's like, hey, who has the best recommendations for food? I'll, we'll meet you there. Come out to our show. And we we're able to get free places to crash. We we're able to get a lot of cool things just from this particular process. So again, understand your audience and be persistent. Like be persistent and show up on a regular basis. Now, a lot of people ask me, like, how do you get so many like TED Talks? How did you get a TED Talk? Well, the, the reality is that it wasn't that special. There's nothing really like totally sexy or like amazing about it. All I did was when, when TED videos started blowing up about um, eight years ago, I went to TED.com. I clicked on events. Then I looked at every single event that they had where I could speak the language and they, were, they had a theme that I had an idea that would be appropriate for. And I just started contacting them. My first year, I contacted 300 events, 300 TEDx events all around the country. And 299 of them ignored me or said, no thanks. But one of them said, yes. Now it's TEDx U of Dub in Seattle, Washington. And guess what? As soon as I got that, I wrote 299 follow-up messages to everyone who turned me down. And I got two more right off the bat. So I got three TEDx talks my first year. And two of those three booked our band to play. Uh, this is just from being persistent. I did the same thing the next year and I got another eight appearances. Then I started uh, emceeing them. Then I started being a, a, a TED consultant and a coach for speakers and presenters. This is what like persistence and consistence can do provided that you demonstrate a value to that particular audience. I always made sure that the idea I had that I pitched them was very specific to that community, that it fit their theme and that it, it was something that could be, uh, that was timely. It, I wasn't just blanking them with a generic pitch. It had to be relevant to that particular audience. It had to give them value. And so I did that for a number of years and through that and uh, by my third year, I had the world record for the most number of TED Talks of anybody on the planet. You know, I, I'm not like some Nobel winning <laughs> scientist. I, I, I didn't do anything like that wild. All I did was like, how can I show up in a way that brings value to other people, show up where they are and be consistent. And that's how I was able to do that. So this is something that I tell folks all the time. <clears throat> Success in the music industry is not something you wait for or something that you hope for. It's something that you create day after day. You guys just continue showing up. And I'll kind of close out with this and then we'll break out into uh, questions. This is actually one of my favorite stories, um, par partially because uh, our band was going through a major legal case involving intellectual property law, uh, but I think it's just kind of fun. So, it used to be a term that was very common back in the day called paper towns. A paper town was basically a copyright trap, a fake place somewhere on the map. Because back in the days, uh, cartographers would make their maps of the world. And you know what? Maps, they kind of end up looking very similar because you know we know the general shape of a country, its terrain, where the cities and the roads are. So there weren't that many distinct things about maps other than the fact that uh, the newest edition might have some new roads or something like that. 
But what cartographers would do to kind of protect their intellectual property rights was they would put a fake place somewhere on the map. There, that way, if someone else produced a map and had that same fake place, they know that their work was stolen from them. So 1938, uh, these guys put out a map, it's called the General Drafting Company. <clears throat> they put out a map of upstate New York at the foothill of the Caskill Mountains, the intersection of two dirt roads, they placed a little fake town there called Aglo. It's just an anagram with the two guys' names. Now nothing really happens until a couple of decades later when Rand McNally, like the Rand McNally, Rand McNally, they published their atlas of upstate New York. And guess what? Aglo, New York was on there. So the small guys are like really excited about this. They call them up, they're like, we caught you, we're gonna sue you. That's a paper town, that's fake, we made it up. You just stole our work. That we, we caught you right-handed and there's irrefutable evidence. Rand McNally's like, oh, we would never copy someone else's work. I, I can't believe you're even accusing us of this. So they decided to resolve this by driving out to this intersection of, the, of these two dirt roads at the foothill of the Cascade Mountains. And guess what they found? They found a town called Aglo. You see, someone kept driving out there, expecting that people kept driving there, expecting there to be a town that one day some guy just decided to build the thing. And he called it Aglo because that what was on his map. I think the fascinating thing is like, it's so easy to assume that the roads and the pathways are already set for us, that, the sh that our maps are shaped by our world. We know the shape of the country and the, country and the states and the rivers within it. But a much more fascinating concept is I think how you could literally change your world. You could change the shape of the world by changing the process in which you map it. The same thing goes for social media, branding, choosing to market yourself in a particular way. Because if you change the process in, you, in which you map it, you don't go the path that everyone else is doing, but you focus on things that provide a return, things that serve that bigger picture, things that are supported by data, and most importantly, things that connect you with a very specific audience, then you could truly change the trajectory of your arts career. So that's my rant on the social for a minute there. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this particular screen and we're diving, we will dive into some questions. Damn. <laughs> oh, it looks like J Jason Shu was up here for a minute. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so if you have any, um, particular questions, feel free to come off mute, I mean, feel free to share, I, I don't and know I'd love to, yeah. I would love to know, like, you're doing so much, and when you first started doing all this stuff, you were still doing so much with, like, doing your degree and, like, 20 million jobs. How did you balance all of that with your physical and your mental health? Yeah, I, well, I would say that when I was doing this, I probably was not a very good example of, uh, of self-care. I, I burnt myself out for a minute. Um, you know, my, some of my bandmates could probably attest to this. Joe, it looks like you're not driving anymore. You're here. <laughs> um, it's, it's tough. Uh, I would say one of the things that I tried to do was like, I created a schedule for myself. So um, I oftentimes say Google is like my BFF. I would make sure everything is locked in my calendar and I would build out time to, uh, specifically work on social or to pitch or, you know, do the things that I thought were necessary for, for kind of achieving those particular goals that I had. Um, I treated it like I was going to have a date with myself or with Google, right? Like this is like the time to build relationships or to um, support a particular campaign. And that's kind of how I organized it in, in very specific blocks of time. Nowadays, um, I actually don't care very much about social <laughs> anymore. Like it's very pretty often <laughs> obvious from my own channels. Um, I, 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 you know, I schedule in time for self care. So it, it's important to have that balance. But um, I would say if you're kind of constrained on capacity or time, 
focus in on the things that provide the greatest return on investment and to provide you with a more direct path. So if you're at a particular point in your career, let's say you're about to launch an album. Um, let's say you're planning for the return of events later this year or early next year and you want to go on tour and you want to do all these live shows. I oftentimes challenge people like, if you think about how many messages you're putting out on social, let's say it's like if you had five main channels and you did a post on every single one a day, that's five a day, that's 75 uh, messages a week. Would you get more from doing those um, the 35 messages via social or by choosing 35 targeted emails to booking agents or to potential partners or funders or other people? Like, it, of course, it's it's important to kind of have a balance of both. But like, if you're limited by time, focus on the things that give you that more direct path to that goal. So. Thank you. Thank you. Other folks, feel free to. Uh, Simon, that was amazing. Um, I'm a bit lost. I, I got. <laughs> started uh, the email list. You know what, come back to me for a second. I have a lot, I have a lot of notes here. <laughs> no worries. Um, we're also going to be uploading the archive of this video on our YouTube channel and uh, the Slants Foundation Facebook page. You can also find our previous artist think tank sessions on there as well. This one is very probably the most webinar one that we're going to have for for some time. Uh, oftentimes it's very much more of a community kind of experience. Um, so we, we kind of shake it up every so often and have different types of presentations. I also mentioned that uh, there's another one coming up in, in March and we're going to have an incredible vocal production coach, uh, coach. So if you like to do vocals, or you do a lot of speaking, singing, um, or want some more like artistic advice, this is Regina Spector's personal coach. She also uh, coaches uh, Zoe Kravitz, Sarah Boreas, um, bunch of, uh, you know, Lee Wong, like the strokes. I mean, she's got quite a list. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually choose someone from the artist think, think tank uh, and pay for full scholarship to do a six week uh, mentorship program uh, with, with this artist uh, coach. So uh, definitely want to register for that one as well. I think I'll ask one. I said, I got to get going, but this has been enjoyable. The, the, get the the help of reporter.com so getting a journalist to feature you that's you have to have something to say <laughs> before that it it helps but honestly if you just sign up you'll start seeing that um the questions that they ask sometimes are very generic sometimes they're just like hey we need to talk about uh talk to someone who has student loan debt or okay. uh you know what are your what's a lot of times, particularly like last month, there was a ton of like gift guides, like what, what's a good gift for women? What's a good gift for men, for kids, for teenagers, whatever, um, you know? So the, That's, like, like it, it's kind of seasonal, but it's also could be very topical. So if you care a lot about politics right now, there's a ton of stuff around politics. Wow. And so, so, so it doesn't necessarily have to be related to your brand, but at the same time, who you are is also your brand. If say that you're an actor, but you still dance and do martial arts, like it, that's still- Exactly. And a lot of times it'll lead, lead to other features too. So like um, I've seen a, like casting calls for reality TV shows on there. I've seen um, people who wanna like have quotes, like inspirational quotes. Like it could be like, what's your favorite inspirational quote? Like I was in um, a magazine for Fortune 500 CEOs a, a few times by providing like my favorite like business motivational quote. And then when I was in that magazine, that I was able to follow up with readers of that magazine, which were mostly CEOs and be like, hey, by the way, are you interested in a partnership program with one of the only Asian American bands in the country? <laughs> and Smooth. you know, and so that's how I was able to get like, over the course of the, probably the 13 years that I was touring with this Lance, we probably worked with about 60 different companies. So, um, you know, a lot more than your kind of typical artists, especially for the, you know, career level where we were, but, but that's how I was able to kind of leverage, um, take that, take that and leverage it to, so that we could actually get on the road more often. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, I got to get going, but it was nice yeah. to meet all y'all. Val, I'd like to talk to you more in the future, especially about your podcast. It sounds like a great thing. And anyone else who wants to connect socials on there. So, uh, 
yeah, everyone take care. Thank you so much for joining us. Do other folks have any uh, questions? I, I'm just going to quickly, it looks like there are a bunch of stuff in the chat box. So I'm going to scan that real quick, but. Okay. Uh, hi, Simon. I just had a quick question while you're scanning. Yeah. Um, so something that I have been personally struggling with is doing the business side while also not compromising the quality of the art like seeing the trend and being vocal and being present while also being honest and having reflection time and working on the craft. So what would you recommend for artists that seem, that, that artists like myself who seem like they're just beginning their journey and I feel like I still need to put more time in the craft, but I still feel this urgency of having to put the craft out there. Yeah. Hope that, that question makes sense. <clears throat> No, I think it's a great question. I think first and foremost, always prioritize the craft. At the end of the day, we're artists. We're not social media marketers. Like, unless that's the job you want, then go ahead by all means. But like, you know, you should always kind of prioritize like developing skill sets. And, and then as you're doing so, you could, but you could think like, how can I leverage this time? So for example, if there's some behind the scenes prep prep work maybe you vlog about the um the process like that's a that's a way to generate content that might be interesting for for other folks who are in a similar position that you can kind of be very candid about and and kind of take them on the journey with you uh there was you know one of my favorite artists imogen heap like was doing this for many years like like back when like video blogging wasn't really kind of a thing but she she made like series of videos of how she recorded her songs. And it'd be things like, oh, I, I got a roll of carpet the other day and I was hitting it with a hammer and put a microphone on it. And it was just like really real stuff. And it was cool. And it was just like, you know, it's not always like these gigantic fancy studios and people, people really love that. So there's that. And then you could also just carve out like very specific amounts of time to create boundaries for yourself. It's like, like saying, you know what, I'm going to work on this. Um, I'm going to dedicate 30 minutes a day to kind of the marketing, to developing these channels or connecting with audiences and, and no more for an hour a day or whatever it is that you want. And then you just make sure that you get the most out of the time that you do have available. So if the time is intentional rather than, I got a push notification, I'm gonna to respond to that. Um, like you could be proactive rather than reactive to the kind of content you're trying to share with the world. Thank you, Simon. I'm like writing it all down. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, thanks. I had a, um, a couple questions. Maybe um, I wrote one in the ch chat about um, my first question being like, how do you like get people's like contact information organically and not sounding creepy? Like, give me your address <laughs> and your phone number. I'm just like, oh boy, how do you do that? organically and also um a question in terms of like creating content i think because i'm still like learning about music production and all that it's my content i don't really have anything like professionally professionally made it's all just like little tidbits and stuff i've been thinking about like video like instagram living just like making music or trying to like brainstorm song ideas but i don't know if that's a good idea or what I should do. I'm just, I produce nothing. It's a barren wasteland at the moment. Truly. All right, well, let, let's deal with the first one for uh, first. So how do you organically get contact info without sounding like a total creeper? Uh, there's a number of ways to do it. Um, if you actually, some, some channels actually let you pull the information. Like if you connect with people via LinkedIn, oftentimes it'll have their email address unless they specifically hide it. Uh, so that's one way of doing it, like using the channels themselves. Another would be doing something like holding a giveaway or a contest. That's how I originally started. Um, you know, I mentioned when we partnered with Fender Guitars, we did a giveaway where you can win a free Hello Kitty guitar. All you had to do was enter your contact info on the site to enter the contest. And there you go. We, we did that. And, you know, our, our email list would grow like roughly 10 to 15,000 contacts at a time. Um, another way is, uh, is just like, like, again, just have fun with it and be creative. So one of the things that I would love doing when, when I was on tour was, 
um, like I'm a sucker for tourist traps. I love these things, like these corny sites, like the biggest ball of yarn in the country or like dinosaurs, especially like a dinosaur right here. Like I love dinosaurs. And so I'll go to places that have postcards on these things and I'll just spend like two bucks and get a stack of postcards. And we would video these things like video blogs that are like showing me buying these things. And then it'd be like, okay, I'm going to randomly select people on our email list. Cause we, you know, we had an email management system for that and say like, and sometimes I'd read their names on the camera or other times I'd be like, if you get this, let me know. And if you want to be on the email list to get one of the postcards for us while we're on tour and traveling across the country, sign up here. Again, just a fun, easy way to, to do this. I think during our height, we had like 70,000 people on our email list. So like the chances of getting a postcard were not the greatest in the world, but, but it was like, I was like, the only way you can get one is if we have your address. I can't do it if you just have it, like email. So it would give them an extra step to engage. And then as they're doing it, the platform I use is called FanBridge. Um, as they're putting in the uh, information, they could ask a question. And a lot of times it'd be like, oh, how did you get the information for this? Or how can we book you? Or like whatever it might be. And so it's just another point of contact where we could develop a relationship with fans. And then um, rather than just like emailing them back an answer, we would film a video of us, especially if we were on tour, we'd just like, hey, thanks for reaching out. Like we're over here getting ice creams, but like we saw your message and this is what we're doing. And so it made it very, very real for them. Um, and then the second question, like, you know, the thing is like, <clears throat> I, I, there's no like real consistent, like one answer in terms of like when to release work. Uh, for, if you ask any artist, like chances are most of the time they'll say it never feels complete. Like even if you release a book or an album or a music video, you're like, oh, I wish I would have done this thing. Um, sometimes it's just good to just, um, you know, ship the work, get it out there and, and, and get people interacting with it. Like get it in as best shape as possible, share it with the world, and then work on your next piece of work. Realize that the, whatever you're working on, it might be the best that you ever do, but it might not be. So just like continue working it. And for a lot of fans, like um, especially your early fans, which are probably pretty much friends and family and, and people you personally know, a lot of times they're just interested in the process. They're interested in you. They, they care about you and they want to see you be successful. So as you say, like, here's an early version of it. I'm still messing with it. And when you come out with the fully polished like studio version, they'll be like really excited to hear it and, and, and be supportive of it. So sometimes it's all right to give that like kind of early rough versions of it, particularly to the people that you trust. And then they can see you kind of grow. They can watch that journey. So it, again, it's like providing a story arc for yourself. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. Sure, thanks. And it's good to see you again. Yay, thank you. It's great to see you too. <laughs> again. Hey, Simon. Um, I was wondering how and why did you decide to get an MBA? Oh, um, the how was because like I mentioned I was doing marketing for all these colleges and they were like, if you go to school, let us know, we'll pay for it or pay for a large chunk of it. So I was like, oh, that's a good value. And, you know, I'm Chinese. So I was like, I can't pass that up. Like, <laughs> gotta, gotta jump on that. Plus, I promised my parents I would get uh, get one because or get a degree because uh, I dropped out of college um, right before graduating, like by two months on a full ride scholarship to tour in a punk rock band. They weren't thrilled about that one but I was like I promise I'll, I'll, I'll go back and I'll make you proud uh, so that was, that was part of it and I, I'm really passionate about teaching I love mentoring other folks and I knew that one of the greatest pathways in and and needed paths is that you got to have a master's degree or higher to do that so I, I eventually went back to school finished my bachelor's and I got an MBA because I was already doing marketing just from all my music work. And um, I kind of felt inclined to it. But I, I also like, I treated the, M, uh, the MBA program like I do, like my relationship is with, with social or websites. 
I was like, what is my objective? My objective is not to get a degree. It's just a piece of paper. I don't care that much about it. My objective when I went into an MBA program, I was like, who's going to be there? What's the target audience? I was like, oh, other people that will probably end up in middle management or C-suite positions at companies. And I, knew, I know that MBA programs are taught mostly by adjunct or part-time professors of real working executives at companies. So I was like, if I'm going into the MBA program, I'm going to make sure that I impress these people in a very particular way. So I normally, like in high school and early college, I hate group work. I, it was like the bane of my existence. But I volunteered to lead every single group project because I wanted to prove that I could be the guy to be relied on that can manage a team. I did it again and again every single class. I made sure to connect with every single teacher, every single student on LinkedIn. I always wrote them a review. Uh, even if they didn't write one back, I always made sure like the minimum, like when say part of some of the classes were online, you had to like, you got graded on like interacting with students and you had to do a minimum of two reaction posts. I was like, no, screw that. I'm reacting to every single student, every single post in the class. And I did this every single time um, because I was like, I'm building relationships. My, my degree is not the piece of paper at the end of the day, like, yeah, I'll get that. My degree is how can I leverage relationships? How can I network better? How can I create a reputation for myself as like someone who can be depended on? And so by the time I graduated, um, because every single master's project was my band. I was like, oh, here's how you market a band. Here's a music project. Here's an album release, whatever. Like by the time I graduated, people were like, this dude knows a lot about business and music. And so I was able to get other sponsorships. Uh, and, and, you know, when I was working at nonprofits in Oregon, I got a lot of people to donate and work with me on campaigns because of that. So whether you choose to get a degree or not, like understand that it's more than just that piece of paper. Just same thing with like, if you decide to jump on TikTok or Twitch or whatever, like have an empath in, in, in mind. That's really cool. Thank you, Simon. This is really helpful. Oh, sure. <laughs> Simon um, sort of did the same thing during my undergrad with my band, like to use the opportunity to get these projects and whatever the project was, I would somehow loop the band into it. And then I would complete the project in my undergrad, but then I'd have this material to use for my band to promote or to pitch, right? for other opportunities. Was that for Ming and Ping or is that a different group? Yeah, for Ming and Ping. So if y'all are in school, <laughs> there's always opportunities to create more content for your for your project um, through the school if you find them. Yeah, and you know, honestly, like the people that teach these classes, they're really excited when this happens because they're like, they don't want to like yet see a, a, yet another case study on Starbucks. <laughs> like they, they get enough of that. They want to see something really interesting. In fact, when I, um, when I, my first time I did this, I was like, can I do a band? And she was like, yeah. And that's how I got in touch with like the VP of Pepsi and like, and their marketing team. And there's like, oh, here's how we, when we ran CBS, this is how we trained artists. And that's how I started learning like how to train for concert performances and things like that. And it's like, so you never know what can happen. Um, it's particularly if your passion is able to shine through. Uh, looks like we had a question. Uh, Crystal, you said, sounds like you have a really clear idea of what you're doing. How do you obtain or how do you obtain and maintain that kind of clarity? You know, uh, a lot of it's kind of trial and error. I, I think it's just figuring out like what it is that you ultimately want to accomplish. So uh, there's this bit of advice that's been going around for a long time where people say like you should follow your passion. And I'm like, Passion is just a feeling. It comes and go. What you should do is bring your passion to whatever it is that you do. And so, uh, like for me, I knew music was like a part of that for, for a long time, ever since I was a kid. But I realized that the reason why I cared about music was because of expression and because I wanted to see something created in the world that I didn't, that didn't exist, that I wanted to make a reality. And when, once I backed up to that bigger picture, I realized that I could still do other things that are similar to that and still feel purpose and, and still be able to feel like uh, motivated to do that work. And so that's how I started speaking, even though I hated public speaking. Like I, you know, in college, I famously told my public speaking teacher, I was like, this is the worst thing. Like, why would anyone want to do this? And now it's one of my primary sources of income is, is, is being a uh, public speaker. 
Uh, I, but I realized that is one of the tools, that's one of the pathways to get to those goals. Same thing with, um, you know, that, how I got into writing and, and why I started writing books. And, and I was just like, these are all just different components of this larger vision of what, I, what it is I want to achieve. So that, you know, it, it takes time and it's all right to change your mind from time to time. But I will say that if you kind of start at the biggest level possible, instead of getting fixated on the tools, it's a lot easier to, to stay motivated and, and stay guided. So you can think like that that's a, this is a step closer to that vision as opposed to like, if you get hung up on like a job title or position, like, oh, my dream is to, um, you know, work at Disney and, 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 and be an animator there. It's like, well, if you don't get that position, then, then what? Like, right. But if you're, if your dream is to be an animator, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's a lot of different pathways to get there, including creating your own content. Hi, Simon. I have a quick question. This is Dean from San Diego. Hey. Hey, I, I found your, uh, your, uh, a lot of good insight and a lot of inspiration. That's really great. Um, you mentioned some things about working with a publicist. When would you, uh, for a musician um, who has music out there, when would you, how important, what, what are the pros and cons to having a publicist? And like, when would be the point when to think about that? Yeah, I think, um, if you have a large campaign and you can start seeing like a five-year plan for yourself, like a long range plan, as opposed to like, I want a lot of streams right now. Uh, that's a good time to get a publicist. If you have a particular end goal, uh, I would say out of all the different people you can work with in the music industry, uh, whether it's a booking agent, a manager, a publicist, uh, publicist is probably going to be dollar for dollar, your best value because it's something that sticks. Like if you get a review, if you get a feature, you'll always have that. And that's, you can use that to create momentum, to create other opportunities, whether it's sponsorship and funding, booking and so on. Uh, and that's what also what attracts the attention of managers, booking agents, labels, and so, et cetera. Um, but you gotta become, be prepared, number one, to have a story, something that's worth writing articles about other than the music itself. Uh, like the music is important, like having a solid record, but having a story that they could grab onto. And you got to have a plan in promoting the record yourself. So uh, oftentimes working on like building a press campaign uh, right before or during a tour is like what most publicists will do if you want to get features and say like uh, alt weeklies um, and things like that. If you want to get national press like Rolling Stone, Pitchfork, Spin, you got to be doing national tours. So you can kind of think of it in terms of scale uh, Bao, you're, you're working with Alex still, right? Right now, right? Yeah, I would say the biggest downside is to be prepared for the cost. Of, uh, <laughs> because it's a long-term relationship. It's not a one-time thing that you drop, right? It's a, the campaign is probably a whole quarter at least or half a year. And so you've got to plan for that and invest in that. And it's like Simon said, it pays off dollar for dollar for sure yeah and, and it helps if you have like a story and this is actually i will say one of the things that is helpful is, is to, if you have a robust social presence that if a journalist like i was talking to alex the other day uh, about this uh, bow is using the my, my former publicist and um if you have a journalist and they have two records that are like they like say equally but they only have space to, to review one, they're probably gonna go with the artist that has more followers or that, that is touring or doing something active because at the end of the day, all these companies that are writing reviews on music, their business is to try and get, is to sell ads and to get visitors to their website. And if you can prove like you can get more people into the door because you have followers or you're very, very active in promoting content, then they're gonna be more likely to choose you. And, and oftentimes they'll even choose you even if your record isn't as good as say someone else because they, they need that traffic. Same thing with like uh, talent buyers. If you're trying to book shows at a venue, at the end of the day, they're gonna give the show to the person that sells the most tickets, not the person that has the absolute best talent or the best voice they've ever heard in the world. Like, because they, they're there to sell drinks, they're there to make money. So, um, you know, if, if okay. you're things up like publicity or uh, other things in that particular way, you're, you'd be like, okay, you know, then you, then you can kind of have a better understanding of like when the right time is, but save your pennies for that one. 
I was like, <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Simon. Long haul. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Crystal says, wondering, why did you stop using social media? I still use social media. Like, I, I, I just stopped caring about trying to amass a large amount of followers and, and things like that. So, like, if you all follow me on, like, uh, Instagram, it's very, like, personal narratives and, like, my posts are oftentimes long. I, I still t actually tweet a lot. Um, and like that, that's probably where I'm active in and on LinkedIn, but I stopped using social media for, for the band in, in that kind of way, because um, it wasn't serving the objectives and, and providing the return on investment quite as much as I'd like anymore. So I get like, I think I kind of, when I was closing out, I was like, what do you get more out of a pointed email or a social post? And I was like, well, for me these days it's, it's email. Cause I know if I, email like 10 people, I could probably get seven speaking engagements out, out of that or virtual events or, or that kind of thing. And if I do 10 social media posts, I might get like a couple hundred likes, but what does that do at the end of the day? You know, so I, I, do, I do it mostly for fun now, I guess, uh, except for LinkedIn, because I, I get a lot of great relationships there. Um, I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, do you think it's ever too late to switch your brand? Like if you've already been growing your artist name, do you think it's ever too late to kind of switch your artist name and switch your brand completely? No, not if you do it right. If, it, it, at the end of the day, I mean, it, there will be a little bit of a starting over period, mm -hmm. but if you connect with the right audience and, and they take to it, then then yeah, you're going to be fine. But, um, you know, it's like kind of like me and Bauer were saying in the beginning, like your, your brand isn't necessarily the things you put out. Those are your brand identity. That's your brand, your brand assets. The brand is the relationship that the audience has with you. So if you could do it in a way that they, that they buy into that they're all about, then and go for it. Like, you know, when, before I started the slants, I thought, like my old band was like, oh, you know, we we're doing so awesome. How am I ever going to like transition out of this? But, you know, now I'm mostly known for the slant. So like it, like that, that happens. Uh, on the other hand, you had Snoop Dogg tried to change his name to Snoop Lion and people are like, no, that's stupid. We're not going to Snoop Lion, that's Snoop Dogg. Uh, you know, Prince tried to change his name to the artist formerly known as Prince, tried to be a symbol. Uh, but then you got like Puff Daddy, P Diddy, <laughs> you know, like you got artists who do it all the time and prove that it's possible. So uh, if you, if you do switch that and just make sure it's very, you're very persistent about it and consistent. I'm pretty sure if like Snoop Dogg, like was consistent about it and was like, yo, don't call me Snoop Dogg. I'm Snoop Lion. Then people would probably like, all right, fine. If, if you want, <laughs> you know, if he's like, I'm, I'm not going to do an interview or, um, perform if you call me Snoop Dogg, then, then people would probably, we better call him Snoop Lion. Thank I have you. one extra point for about that for you, Corin, which is um, give yourself like a little bit of a transition period because social media and all the communication methods, you're gonna reach a number of people with each blast, right? And so if you give yourself like a month or two months or three months to do that transition, uh, you're more guaranteed to hit all of the people involved. So, um, you know, don't do like a quick switch because that'll lose a lot of. That's yeah. true. Thank you. Yeah, and you can you can supplement with paid. You could, um, you know, and this is where again, if you have oh, like you own that contact list, it's a lot easier. Um, if you have a publicist, it's easier. Like th these things help ease that, but. But yeah, if you if you think about it, like you create a story or narrative of why you're switching and and as Bao mentioned, you kind of like share it over time, you're gonna be much more likely for it to stick. Yeah, and share it before too, not not just after you do it, like in the lead up to it. Yeah. All right, so we've got like three more minutes. If there's any or if there are any other questions, I know like people need to bounce and it's getting late for some of us. Uh, Mike, you raising your hand? Hey, Mike, again from China. Yes, I was. Hey, this is, um, this is uh, we can't hear you. Your audio is very soft. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? 
it's pretty faint. Okay. Is it is it is it at all better? Am I coming in clear enough to say something? It's better. I can understand you. Cool. Hey everyone, thanks for um thanks for having me. Hey um two things. Number one, um I was uh, hearing the um this guy um talking about how we can get how how they can um get in touch with someone, right? Get, how how they can get in touch with someone without sounding creepy. Now this is something that I uh, do. I watch out for um uh, Instagram Live. So whenever somebody goes on Instagram Live, I make sure I jump on it and I pitch them an idea. Let's, for example, uh, let's uh, to give you an example. I let's say, oh, I'm in the t-shirt business. Let's say I'm in the t-shirt business. Let's say, hey, I love your t-shirt. Can I, can I swap one? I got two uh, t-shirts that I want to swap with you. Is that cool? I type that onto the Instagram um, live, uh, the, 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 the the type, the, 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 the text box, and watch out for his facial expression. Now, his facial expression would indicate that whether he saw or did not see. Um, my message. Uh, if he sees it, I'll follow it up and say, "Hey, I'm gonna DM you right now with my email address. Let's talk more there." So that's one. So that's one of the um the tactics that I use um to get uh to get in uh to, to, to not only get in touch uh not in, get in touch with someone but to pitch an idea. So that's that's um so that's um for, that's uh so so that's that's um uh, something I want to share. Uh, the second one. The second question is now. Um, you said um understand the system now by system um you uh, uh you, you mean all of the um the, uh, the social media platforms such as instagram now as is there a way that i could um quickly understand the system uh and stay up uh, and stay updated with it or um you know because the reason why i ask is um you know you, you get you get shadow banned so easily um on instagram um you know uh I, you don't even really even know it so i so it is important to understand what the guidelines are where you where you have to where you have to draw the line uh, uh find the fi find that fine line between creating engaged engaging content where people can actually feel emotion right and not go overboard uh, to the point that you get shadow banned is there a way? Is there a way that, um, uh, like some some YouTube um, videos that you can watch to understand what this what they're all about, right? So they want to make money, and they want to you know keep things lovely lovely. What is where is that where is that line drawn, and where can users like me uh, find out about it to find out the, the the guidelines about it? Yeah, so that's so that's my question. Thanks, man. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we're at time. So thank you so much for everyone for, for, for joining us, particularly those who had been joining for the first time. Um, you know, just a reminder, we have a couple of other things coming up. Um, again, for the Science Foundation, like or our sole purpose here is to provide resources and mentoring for Asian American artists and activists. And so like, feel free to get in touch if you have questions. We're gonna be um, announcing a new grant program. We're also gonna be organizing a new music business conference that's specifically geared for artists of color where all the speakers, all the keynotes are gonna be people of color. And there's gonna be a, a way to, um, to connect and build coalitions with other folks and artists. It's gonna be a really amazing time. Uh, that's gonna be coming up in the summer but again we have this monthly workshop we have other resources that we're um, going to be announcing on a regular basis so you can follow at the slants found or check in at the slants.org on a regular basis you all got my email it's my personal email it comes right to me so feel free to connect anytime if you have questions i mean that's what we're here for like uh you know we we we, we love being here for that for you all for for providing space for community and uh we hope you join uh, next month as well. Uh, and hint, it's every, the third Thursday of every single month where we have this call. But if you're unable to join us, we'll, we'll post the videos online so everyone can see it as well. So thank you again. And I hope you all have a great night.